Okay, in this episode, let's talk about carbon capture. Now, if you remember, I said previously, um, Peter Wadham and really uh, observational Arctic scientists, climatologists have come out and said, or climate scientists have come out and said, uh, this really is our last ditch attempt uh, at saving the human species from imminent and catastrophic abrupt extinction. Now, he doesn't use those words exactly, but he uses everything he can short of that. There's been quite a long tradition of scientists uh, in agreement to downplay the seriousness, um, increasingly the seriousness of the situation, increasingly that's starting to change. But uh, the tone now is clearly that nothing else is going to work except this massive project that's many times bigger than the Manhattan. It's bigger than the Manhattan Project, the Apollo Project squared. It's a massive last-ditch effort. What they're really saying is, talking about the man, uh, you know, Apollo program, is that we are in Apollo 13. Now, if you remember the movie, you remember Tom Hanks as uh, James Lovell, one of the things they had to do was to make a CO2 scrubber. They had a lot of problems because they blew out the oxygen supply, the oxygen tank blew. So almost everything relied on oxygen um, on the uh, on that mission. So even electricity. So they had to um, jury rig a scrubber because they didn't. The scrubber in the lifeboat that they were in uh, was not sufficient to actually remove all the CO2 from the air. Almost exactly the position that we're in on a large scale on planet Earth. Um, you remember that they got, they jury rigged a scrubber out of filters. They had round filters, uh, but not enough of them. Um, but they had square filters in the descent module. So they got duct tape and NASA helped them prototyping on the ground and then they duct taped together uh, these lithium hydride boxes and I think a spacesuit as a pump. Uh, to actually circulate air through them so they could scrub CO2 into the lithium hydroxide filters. Now, the Earth size equivalent of doing that is really to make these huge machines on the ground that will take in large, large amounts of oxygen. Now, bear in mind that the CO2 is up in the troposphere, it's up in the higher atmosphere. But the idea is that you would just take masses amount of oxygen, pump it through these machines, and really filter it. So, in other words, have some of those lithium hydride filters or uh, some kind of, um, basically lithium, you think of limestone, it's, it's rock. So, right, so they have some of these things demonstrated, and <clears throat> I'll mention why. Um, why you don't want to do this and why they, they won't work. Um, okay, so, so the idea is uh, that you just take lots and lots of air, you send it through a filter in a massive scale, and then, you know, you have Earth as Apollo 13 and we've got this jury-rigged scrubber. Yay! Okay, so, now the first problem is to just state the size of the problem, just so you get an idea um, of what we're talking about. You, you've probably heard of 400 part per million. That's the dangerous levels. That's the point of no return, in effect, in, um, in terms of uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. <coughs> well, we've exceeded that 400 parts per million, but 400 parts per million is part of the problem. Uh, the CO2 is too dense in the atmosphere, but like all these things, they kind of designed, it's almost as if the fates determined that they absolutely hated the human race, or at least the greedy part of it. Uh, and the, the fact that it's 400 parts per million means it's exceptionally dilute. How dilute it is, just imagine, you know, the, the, uh, the Rose Bowl or the Super Bowl, and uh, just imagine out of the entire crowd... In the Super Bowl, you, you have to pick out, like, you know, 
12 mates in t-shirts basically just a, a frat party of 12 guys in a t-shirt that says you know I love bread and circuses please distract me more or something so you got to pick those 12 guys out of an entire crowd at the Super Bowl and that's what you're doing in terms of picking out CO2 molecules out of the atmosphere so why this is um, even if it worked it wouldn't work so okay the first thing to notice about this is again framing so if you look at some of these projects um, a very small scale and they all everybody admits well yeah we're gonna scale these up in a huge uh, project okay here's the problem if you look at some of these videos promoting uh, some of these carbon capture schemes they have a general theme and this is the general theme for humanity back to the beginning of civilization and the problem is the framing that I mentioned before so what you'll see is that they often you know they trumping it up they basically trying to get funding so they promotional videos they give you the ele elevator pitch essentially for they're doing you know um, the uh, dragon's den you know kind of thing they're basically raising money um, so they show how you know they've installed these vast banks of fans basically extractors that they're going to pump air through um, and then they're going to try and get some co2 out of it now they have a general theme and that's when they show you they're putting up these huge banks of fans they have everybody smiling and everybody yay you know this works yay and then we get the co2 and we put it in a greenhouse and it makes 30 percent more growth for the plants yay you know the climate deniers were right co2 is plant food yeah <laughs> okay oh by the way on if you are one of those guys it's the co2 is in the upper atmosphere that's the dangerous one one down here that's plant food is not that so dangerous so anyway um but uh, yeah, so then we can, you know, have masses of greenhouses, feed the world, 30% more production, yay. And, okay, there are a couple of things that you've got to think. Now, this is how they frame it. Mental frames, killer mental frames. Is just off to the frame, you see them assembling, you know, they're all cheering and clapping because they're assembling this huge monstrosity. They don't mention the fact that, first of all, there's a big crane that's lifting these things into into place and it's it's belching diesel you know it's basically fossil fuels they don't mention that this thing is made out of steel they don't mention how much energy goes into making steel the Bessemer process has an extraordinary amount of, of oxygen you're, you're better off using just the Bessemer process to suck in oxygen and try and you know, make carbonized steel out of all that, that air. Um, but rather than make steel and then try and capture it too. The other thing is they normally next to a power plant or some place where they have free energy. Um, so they're taking your tax dollars to run these huge fans and then they getting back pennies um, on the dollar, if that, um, by giving CO2 to some... Uh, horticulturist who's, go, who's going to grow cabbages really, uh, in a greenhouse so they don't show you the full picture because as I mentioned in previous videos the, the whole cost accounting makes all of this stuff fall flat on its face now all of these projects they would have been done um, by philanthropists or otherwise by government money your tax money and so that's part of the reason why I'd say uh, you should probably try and monkey wrench these things. I really think, okay, now this is a personal preference. Now, if you know people like Peter Mann come and say, you know, catastrophizers are—that's um, his word for realists—are, um, he says that you know that they almost want the world to come to an end it's basically if you try and come up with these solutions then people you know they they seem to actually hate them they they hate these solutions and they want them you know they want the world of the end that's what he says it seems like like catastrophizers are 
Now, I would come out and fess up to this thing is if if it takes these kind of projects, these geoengineering projects, to save the world, I have to fess up and say, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to pull the plug on it. I mean, I'm ready for humanity to go extinct. I would want hum- humanity to go extinct. That's my mea culpa. And why? Well, the first thing you've got to know about these things is they're going to be done on tax dollars. So if you think you're overburdened at the moment, it's going to get a lot worse to pay for these uh, white elephants. Uh, There's no guarantee they would work, but almost definitely, uh, you know, Exxon is not going to be paying for these things. It's... And by the way, uh, full disclosure, I'm long on <laughs> on Exxon. I actually have shares in Exxon. Um, I'm not shorting them because, you know, I think it's almost a given that um, we'll go to war soon and uh, the oil price will spike. Uh, so, yeah, they will engineer that. I'm so sure of it. I've got a bet on it on the stock market. But anyway, um, yeah, so in terms of... Uh, you have to see these things in terms of the bailout for the sinners again. It's, it's like 2008 and the financial uh, crisis is, you know, privatized profits, uh, collectivized responsibility. So these scrubbers are cleaning up for companies, big oil like Exxon and all, you know, Royal Dutch Shell and all these criminals. So once again, using taxpayer money to bail out the mass of these criminals, psychopaths. So um, BP, Royal Dutch Shell, Exxon, all these criminals, the Saudi family, the Bush oil family, all these criminals um, really are getting off once again. Um, it's just like recycling. I've been telling people not to pick up litter and recycle on the beaches. Uh, we, we did this we, last, last year at about the same time as this um, in the previous place I was wintering in uh, um, in Greece, and all the English sailors, you know, interventionist and fix the problem, you know, all that stuff, which I told you is a killer. Um, all organized huge parties to go down and clean the beach um, because there's a fantastic beach, it's a, a turtle breeding ground, and so the idea was to clean the beach. Now, what you're doing if you're doing that kind of cleanup is you're just picking up. Uh, the corporate trash for corporate psychopaths. What you should be doing is suing them to make them pick up their own trash. Now the same applies with the CO2. It, it came from all these energy companies and we are then putting the bill to clean it up. Uh, what you should be doing is just suing them. Just sue them out of, out of existence. So they made put the CO2 up there, they must get it down again. Of course, they can't. They'd go bankrupt, which is an in- indication first of why this is not economically viable. If you, uh, if you made big oil and the energy companies, the coal companies, pay for all the CO2 emitters, if you sued them and made them pay for scrubbing the carbon that they put up there out of the atmosphere, that would be it. That would be the end of the economy. Now, that's from a financial point of view. So why the tax you know, payer is supposed to be able to carry this burden is, is ludicrous. And why they would is also ludicrous because it's saying, okay, we fucked it up. Now, we want you to, you know, stick with the Stockholm Syndrome. Stick with us. We, we're out here to protect you, even though it doesn't look like it, even though we fucking, you know, basically snuffed out this planet very obviously. But we still want you to be with us. The captain and crew of this ship is still here to help you. So we're going to put this huge tax burden on you. And you're going to carry us through. Same old story for the past 8,000 years. And this is how you're going to spend your last days. Are you up for it? No. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to pull the plug on humanity rather than carry on with that. I'm so fucking sick of capitalism, of lies, of all this bullshit, of all this greed that got us here that I'm ready to pull the fucking plug. I really would, personally, I'm talking personally now, I would like to see human, humans go extinct if that's how they survive.
if that's the only way to survive, I'm done. I'm done with capitalism. I'm done with this horseshit. I am absolutely fucking sick of it. So much so that I would really, I mean, just say, I, w I, I would actually rally comrades to monkey wrench these schemes uh, as much as possible. Um, yeah, just go all out uh, because they, they probably going then they're not going to work and i'll tell you why they're not going to work just from a physics point of view I've kind of mentioned why they're not going to work for from a financial point of view but i would say that they taking any quality time we have left so if you think scrubbing oxygen first of all it's too slow right they, they we're going to get crop failures and drought long before any of these make an impact um so all those trees that are kind of being planted now by again green do-gooders who are the same people doing the recycling are planting trees well all those trees that you're planting no matter how big they are as soon as the drought hits they just contribute to the carbon because they're going to die and they then they're probably going to be you know wiped out by forest you know forest fires uh, just like in california so you you can't plant a tree now and expect it uh, to be a carbon sink it's a carbon sink for a little while, but only until the droughts and stuff catch up. Could be this year, 2019. Okay, now, why this doesn't work as a physics problem is what I've said before. It's a Maxwell demon. Now, I don't think anybody knows what a Maxwell demon is. It's, it's, this is crucial that you understand what a Maxwell demon is. This is another thing where people... Okay, I mentioned linear thinking frames and feedback loops. The people don't have a basic misunderstanding. I think the human brain, or rather what I've been calling the alien court, it's the left side, the intellectual side, the side they give PhDs to. That side doesn't understand, lin or is very prone to linear thinking. It is a linear sequential computer, in effect. The framing, it, it really has limited computing capacity, so it puts everything in a frame, like, hey, look at this wonderful carbon capture scheme. Don't look at the side of the curtain where we have to actually power the fans. We have to actually make the steel to make these things. We have to take, um, you know, basically all these filters, and then some, some people say, well, you can take them out to sea. Brilliant lim linear thinking. You take the lithium out to sea. It's a base. You can use it. Now we've acidified the ocean, so you can use it for uh, basically um, using it as a base, putting soap in the water to, <laughs> to make the oceans less acidic. And don't count the fact that we would have to put these on a super ship and they would have to go all the way around the world to where there's the most acidification. I mean, don't count all that. That carbon doesn't matter. The fact that you're extracting carbon, but all the scheme around it, if you count everybody's contr contribution all the way down to the breakfast of the guys that actually manufactured this you'll find out what i said in the gebekli tepe video is it's negative eroi so that gives you a clue to why you can't have a maxwell demon the maxwell demon is james clark maxwell who is the brilliant genius physicist that you mistakenly think einstein is uh, einstein's a fraud James Clark Maxwell was the genius. Uh, it's it's difficult to, you know, I won't get this sidelined by telling you how fantastic a genius he was, but um, what James Clark Maxwell did was to, he showed a thermodynamic problem to show you why you can't have a perpetual mach uh, motion machine in effect, no matter what scale. So this is uh, Maxwell demon. It became known as a Maxwell Maxwell's demon or Maxwell demon because um, it was a, a thought experiment that essentially says I could actually take uh, two chambers, have a little gate, and a Maxwell demon could actually spot little particles. If they were fast moving ones, he would let them go through, um, uh, or rather he would block them. If they were slow moving, he would let them go through. And then the idea would be that he could actually cool one side of the chamber just by being clever with, with a gate. Uh, Maxwell showed that that was impossible because the Maxwell demon himself would take too much energy to actually keep the information state of each side. So in other words, opening and closing the gate would uh, be a net negative um, response. So it was a thought experiment that proved conclusively that on a thermodynamic basis, um, put on a firm um, 
physical and mathematical footing that you can't have a perpetual motion machine. Now, perpetual motion machine is a feedback cycle and people really, really struggle with this concept. I started to realize how, I mean, I've known for years that uh, iteration, feedback, runaway um, loops, exponential growth scenarios is very difficult to comprehend. Uh, I'm a, I've spent 30 years being a software engineer, so it's very, very native to software engineers. Uh, tail recursion uh, is, and um, looping um, uh, uh, principles of, of really as natural as breathing for uh, particularly um, programmers in functional programming languages. But I have actually known of programmers that had to drop out of programming because they couldn't understand the concept of tail recursion. And it's basically this. You have a little routine. You call that routine programmatically. And somewhere inside the routine, it calls itself. Well, people go, whoa, 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 hang on. It's disappearing up its own ass. And it is. So you have to have some kind of gate or condition that actually makes it break out of the stack and comes back out. Otherwise, you, uh, as a programmer, you're used to uh, putting in bugs where it runs away. So what happens when it quickly runs away, goes asymptotic in, um, in terms of memory consumption and the machine crashes. So if you get a recursive function wrong, machine crash is so part of your oxygen, you don't really struggle with that if you're a computer program. But other people do, so much so that I've seen people have to drop out of college because they just can't get their head around the, this concept. Now, uh, there's another example of this I realized with my nephew. So I mentioned him before, and he's a millennial in his late 20s. And I point, there's this thing called uh, Sea Start. It, it's, it, you put it off the back of a boat, and it's a generator that takes the current from the slipstream of the boat and generates electricity from it. And so, you know, these are the kind of discussions that sailors have about what kind of generator to have, wind or one of these sea starts. Well, <clears throat> I was saying, you know, you don't want... Oops, now I've just probably... Um, yeah, okay, forget, forget the word <clears throat> sea start. Uh, that's a brand name. So just let's say a generic uh, generator. So, so the generic generator in the sea, I'm saying you don't want one of those because it's creating gra drag on the boat to make electricity and it's kind of kind of productive and um, it's kind of stupid as I said it's kind of like people that think you know you could power an electric motor and then that could drive the boat and I was a little bit surprised that um, my Duma nephew um, thought you could so here let's go over it again this is what he thought he thought that you could get you could put a turbine in the water outside the boat have it collect energy from the movement of the water. You could put it in a propulsion system, electric motor. It could drive an electric motor that would drive a propeller and drive you through the water. Now, hopefully you know that this is not possible and you know why. It's because of Carnot's heat engine and the fact that you, know, you, have, um, you have friction, you have all these kind of heat losses that are unavoidable as part of thermodynamics and so you can't do that now uh, this is not obvious to the human brain it's it's really um, it's not obvious to the human brain so the perpetual motions machines um, are so counter count it's counterintuitive that they don't work so perpetual motion machines uh, don't work because a Carnot engine uh, is really a bound system it's a closed therm thermodynamic system and then you have to throw in shit friction and Murphy's law and then it means that you can't ever get more out of a closed system than you put in kind of obvious when you put it that way but when you show mechanisms for perpetual motion in in France I believe uh, in the 18th century or 19th century they had to ban uh, patterns for perpetual motion machines because there were just so many there was a craze of, of people trying to build perpetual motion machines even though the science and physics said that it was impossible no one really believed it and the reason why they banned patterns was they said so much 
of the intelligence of the young young people is being put into this futile effort that they just banned it just to stop them trying to do it. Now, with the scrubber, you're in exactly the same position. People won't get that it's a perpetual motion machine and say that what you're doing with carbon capture is, on the one hand, you're putting carbon up into the atmosphere, then you're having a machine to pull it back out again. This, this is a negative ER, EROI situation. There's, there's no way you could do it. And that's even before you start looking at the socio-political landscape. Okay, if you remember in one of the previous videos I did, I mentioned uh, Biosphere 2 and the fact that it was really, a, it's considered a massive failure, but it was actually a success because what it showed you was that you, ha you can only make a biosphere the size of Earth. That's the takeaway lesson from it, so nobody got that lesson, but I mentioned in there that one of the reasons why it failed was because of CO2 scrubbing. They, they secretly, they couldn't make it self-sustaining because it was too small a scale, so you couldn't get the plants to consume all the CO2, uh, it just didn't work. So they secretly put in a CO2 scrubber. Basically they did carbon capture exactly like they intend on the Biosphere 1 Earth. Uh, it didn't work, they had to abandon it, right? And you must remember that lesson. Uh, it didn't work because it is a closed system. And just ordinary thermodynamics tells you that what they're trying to do is a Maxwell demon. It can't work on an Earth size either. Because Earth is also a closed system. It only worked because it was a kind of a boundary condition uh, the only reason why the Earth is a living planet is because it was very, very finely ba balanced on a, on a boundary condition. And what humans have done with greed and really what I've said all through the alien cortex I've called, but really human ego, uh, this intellectualizing part, this part here in your brain has, has tipped the balance. So there isn't a balance of nature, it is dynamically unstable. But it's dynamically unstable with limits. So it reaches guardrails and then feeds back and comes back. So it's really Lovelock's Gaia theory. He was right. Uh, what, where it's not right is to assume that, oh, Gaia makes it dynamically stable and it always pulls it back into a point of stability. No, it's very easy to perturb onto a trajectory of runaway catastrophe. So I mentioned before, runaway cold or runaway heat and that's what we've done and what we will do until everybody stops intellectualizing um, and stops the greed and the strategizing and all, all of that. So it's kind of the same old biblical stuff people have been saying forever. Now imagine you do get this set up. What's Exxon and all these people going to do now and also the people that make these scrubbers? Right? They're going to use it as tax dollars, but of course... They're not going to basically be government-owned. They're going to be privatized, aren't they? So you're going to have an incentive to keep this system going. So you'll have incentive to build more and more of these carbon captures. Exactly the same thing as we saw with solar panels. And everybody will say, and they sell it because they say it's getting cheaper, it's getting cheaper. And they're not showing that it's actually not, uh, not only cost-effective, it's a huge burden on the, on the taxpayer. Uh, the economy would have to rev faster just to support it. You would have to work harder. It's more slavery, more wage slavery. And then they tell you, but you've got jobs. And say, so, like, yeah, you've got now your fourth job. You couldn't handle three, and they put your fourth bullshit job. So, uh, and the job would be just chasing your tail for, for no end, right? You're just wasting any quality time you've got left in the machine. They're just keeping you on the treadmill for the remainder of your time in hospice. So I think it's cruel to keep uh, the human population on a treadmill in hospice. We should be enjoying ourselves, and that's my major thesis. So now imagine what the reverse incentives you have for some somebody like um, the criminals, like uh, you know these uh, energy companies. These psychopaths obviously um, will not only get into the business of scrubbing the bullshit that they put up there, um, all these poisons they put up in the atmosphere, they actually have an incentive now to put more up so that they can capture more. Because, yay economy! And economists actually will look at this on paper and say, this is great. Except, 
it's not getting anywhere, it's not saving anybody, and your life will be made exceedingly shit with a double tax burden. So it's just keeping the criminals um, fed once again in luxury. It's staving off what they know is coming. So it, it works very well from their point of view because they're selling hopium. They're selling hopium because they don't want to get in their jets and, and go to New Zealand uh, just yet. That's the final escape plan. But while they can stay in Saint-Tropez, they want to. Uh, and so they will string you along and they will back all these um, criminal schemes just, just because they know people are desperate and ing- ignorant and that's the business uh, for 8,000 years of protection rackets. So again, it's the same old lie. We'll protect you. No, they're just greedy and will make a shitload of money out of you. They will stave off the pitchforks and um, delay having to get in those planes. By the way, I mentioned in the previous video, which I don't think you you realized, again, all those Christians, right, that you you saw the reason why they're going out and buying um, intercontinental jets is because they're making getaways to New Zealand. They are not... They want to avoid the rapture, right? All you evangelical Christians that, you know, hear that, oh, this is a God machine. This is a machine for spreading love and the word of Jesus. No, it's basically so they can fucking get to New Zealand. That's why there's been this craze of them buying these intercontinental jets. Wake up, you fuckers. Wake up, particularly you Christians. So, um, yeah, they don't believe in the rapture. They, uh, they're stringing you along. And so, yeah, let's maybe in the next video, let's talk about the Christians. Um, so anyway, yeah, I love you all in spite of you all. And I've got to say that's more than uh, the Old Testament God ever did. So, bye.